Uh, hello everybody and welcome to the Surge podcast. Now, hear me out because this might be a bit of a weird concept. What I'm not saying is that we should have a time limit in what we can do in the resuscitation room or any limit. Uh, that's not what I'm saying here. What I am saying is there are certain therapies that would benefit from being treated definitively outside the ED and outside the resuscitation room. And a lot of these therapies have time to definitive therapy as an independent factor in their success or failure. And as we've seen during the past couple of busy months to years, depending on where you live, because of obvious reasons that you can see on the news there are some patients that will benefit more from bringing in the resuscitation room than others especially when those other patients can be treated elsewhere effectively now these include patients who require primary PCI for an MI or patients that need an urgent craniotomy or a burr hole or patients that have a penetrating abdominal injury and the knife is still in it's very hard to treat a knife still in a patient in the emergency room or in the resuscitation room. It's scary enough to see it meets activation criteria, don't get me wrong. But those are particular pathologies that do require definitive surgical care. So hear me out and give me the next 15 minutes of your time. If you're not bored and fall asleep. We all know that primary PCI works. We all know that cities that have primary PCIs that happen within 90 minutes or less get the maximal benefit. 60 minutes, one would argue. Paramedic contact to balloon time of less than 90 minutes is known to be critical for patient care even to the extent that it is reviewed and seen as a quality indicator for certain accreditation bodies and centers. We know this. There is now an increasing body of data that says that bypassing the emergency room for these particular patients and having your cath team available to you to assess the patient and take them from the paramedics straight to the angio suite might be the best option for your patients. Now, granted, there are exceptions. If your patient's been in a car accident and you're not sure what's going on and there's a risk of bleeding if you give them certain things, and we can make up different exceptions to these rules, but in general, these patients, I think that we can all agree, are best treated in the cath lab. And apparently, there's a growing body of data that makes this very clear to us. And this data has been published and replicated multiple times. And I can see it becoming the standard of practice. I can see certain centers which have the capability to do it bypassing their emergency rooms. Having their paramedics identify a code STEMI and moving forward from there with a dedicated PCI team available for response as a life-threatening transport-related response. And the results speak for themselves. Pre and post implementation, you had a significant reduction in 90 minute door to needle time. Above anything, without p values, forget it, it's just there. Okay? Similarly, with uh, door to needle time for PCI and then for balloon inflation, which is extremely important. So, door to balloon was also significantly improved as was uh, the EMS contact and arrival to the PCI center. Okay, now it's very hard to calculate that, but if, if they have a reduction in that as well, it tells you that there's something good here. Okay, now one can argue that although door-to-needle time is something that, that should be implemented, 
and should be kept on as a metric, one can make an argument, and I would not say that this is a valid argument, I'd argue against it, and I'll tell you my argument against it, but one can make the argument that bypassing the ED could mean that somebody misses something. Here's my argument against that. The paramedics who are assessing these patients have been doing it for an extremely long time. No matter what your specialty is, if you're making an argument, with all due respect to you, I'm sure that you're extremely qualified, a cardiologist, anesthesiologist, or ED physician. If your argument against this is you're afraid of somebody making a mistake in a field that they have similar expertise to you, in the sense that they've been doing it for years, and they've had it validated for years, much like you have, I think that you should build enough trust with them to be able to work with them towards this goal if you have the resources to do it. Now, there are centers that don't have the resources to do it. It's very clear. But the data has been replicated multiple times on both sides of the Atlantic. And it's just there. Being able to perform a departmental bypass to save a patient's life when they require a primary PCI seems to be where we're going, if not already there in many centers. Now, much like door-to-needle time, door-to-craniectomy time has also been studied. Now, the problem with craniectomies is there's a little bit more to it than an ECG and a cardiac workup. I do agree with you. And these patients are oftentimes polytraumas, and this is just a publication from McGill, um, my alma mater. Uh, you shouldn't read it because I work there, but you should uh, read it because it's actually a good publication. And it shows that outcomes are related to temporal delays in craniectomies. Now, it's mainly a descriptive study, and it's mainly a discussion, but the same thing happened with door to needle time. Primary PCI in the early days had the same limitations. But now that we're looking for the data, as you can see in the JAX paper, having a clinical support decision making tool that limits the number of moves that you make in the ED and pushes you towards imaging early and then towards operating early, should the need be arise, helps in many patients. If not, I would assume a lot of patients will benefit from the data, but this is particular, this paper from JAX is particular to older patients. And what this paper found was getting a quick history, checking for anticoagulation, scanning their heads, and then deciding on a craniectomy in that order and going to the operating room without going back to the resuscitation room, without having a discussion about whether or not we should go back, but having that structured, ordered method not only saved lives or saved resources, but saved lives in elderly patients, which, as many of you know, carry a poorer prognosis when it comes to traumatic brain injuries. In fact, there are some centers that make arguments based on age, in addition to GCS and other factors, obviously, in this size of the bleed. But there are centers that do make that argument, unfortunately. I personally don't. I'm oftentimes against that argument. But there are centers that do. And, you know, to each their own here, but the data is pretty clear that centers that take care of their patients equally and have standardized care, where it's a one-stop shop and it's one way out, and we're calculating the time that it takes. And we're not going back, and this decision's been made. Centers that have that attitude, their patients do better. This is also true for many trauma activation patients. Now, when you look at the subset data in this paper from the Journal of Trauma, the trauma activation patients that benefited from this, or that did better, had less than an hour in general in the resuscitation room. And at the same time, a lot of them were operative patients that required interventions. Which brings me to uh, this paper. Sorry, this paper, oops, um, which talks about emergency uh, department length of stay and emergency surgeries. Now, when you look at the fine print on this paper, it's not the 
most be all and end all paper that you can think of. And the length of stay is certainly more than it would be in many ivory um, tower centers, I like to call them. But what it does show is these patients were very high risk, they were very unstable, and they were unstable to the point that you needed to operate on them early. So examples would be something like an necrotizing fasciitis. It would be very hard to justify keeping that patient in the resuscitation room. That patient would benefit from a definitive surgery early. Another example would be, like I said, a stab wound to the abdomen with clear bowel injury or clear bowel evisceration. That patient should not be staying in the resuscitation room for any length of time. There's nothing that you're going to do there that you cannot do in the operating room. And if you do have a delay because of limitations of another department, for example, if you are in a, a non-trauma center and there are certain staff that have to come from home, then you can make an argument that you have to definitely, most absolutely control the airway for whatever reason. For example, if they're severely intoxicated and are combative and might hurt themselves. Granted, there are argu arguments to be made like that. There are other arguments that I can think of. For example, a patient that is so hypotensive, even though they're fast positive, that their systolic is tanking. It's in the 40s or 50s, and they are bradycardic, and all hell is breaking loose, and you know that they're bleeding to death. Those patients would benefit from an ED thoracotomy or a reboa before going for definitive surgery. I agree with you on that point. But, despite those arguments, and many other arguments that I've heard while giving a very similar presentation before, don't really pan out for me because I always go back to how trauma centers were developed over time and how activation criteria were developed over time. So, if you have a total of 15 criteria, which many of us do in our trauma centers, and you can get people to adhere to them. And you can coordinate trauma care with your neurosurgeons, even if they're in different centers. Plastic surgeons, even if they're in definitive centers that are completely different than yours. Uh, whoever else you want to call, orthopedics, urology, or, uh, max fax guys, you name it. If you can definitively do that in an extremely short amount of time, it shouldn't be a limitation for you. It can't be a limitation for you. I do agree that ED thoracotomies should be done in the emergency room. Reboas should be done in the emergency room. But I don't agree that a patient with a clear traumatic brain injury that is isolated, that requires a CT brain, plus or minus reversal of anticoagulation, is really benefiting from the resuscitation room when another patient can benefit from them. especially in resource-poor environments. And it doesn't work for all problems. It's not going to be something that will make the resuscitation room end at your center. It's designed to improve quality of care as a concept. And it is only a concept. I haven't applied this in practice. I haven't applied it in real life to any of my patients yet. But it is a concept. And it's a concept that I think is starting to become more and more clearly involved in the way that we manage our patients from the field to definitive care. But I think that this will work in pathologies and in problems that have a predefined workup and that, that already have proven data. This isn't a one-size-fit-all thing. And that it shouldn't apply just to make metrics look good. I can guarantee you that the ED with zero mortalities generally also has the fastest admission times because they have predefined protocols that automatically admit the patients on paper or on the computer system and that automatically have an extension to the ED that's going to be where uh, the referrals are all taken care of and where all the consults are all taken care of. It's very hard to run a high flow, extremely busy ED with zero mort annual mortality and zero annual problems and quality indicators that are just that perfect and a time to admission of less than five minutes. It's just not going to happen, right? But it should 
be thought of that something like bypassing the ED for the cath lab in certain cases might be something to talk about over coffee one day or a drama club. I'm just saying. And it should never deprioritize other patients in the ED. You shouldn't be doing this and then blocking off the OR on somebody that might need definitive surgery for another reason that is also emergent, but a slightly more complicated. An example might be a polytrauma with a completely evolved leg uh, and a question of a brain injury and they went to CT scan and because you, they're off protocol, they're gonna have to wait. It, it shouldn't be like that. It should be a quick and definitive discussion for a very limited number of cases. Those are just the three that I found enough literature on to make an argument with. But I'm sure that there are others that you can think of. And it doesn't mean that we're taking over the resuscitation room area or the ED ICU or even the role of the ICU or anything like that. The take home message here is that there's something to be said about bypassing the emergency room sometimes for certain things that will obviously be treated in the operating room or in the cath lab. And it's very hard to make an argument that staying in the ED is going to treat those things superiorly. Something that needs a cath lab should go to a cath lab. Something that needs a knife taken out should go and have the knife taken out. Something that needs a delay like an ED thoracotomy because you want to clamp off the aorta and then move on to perform the rest of your damage control surgery should spend some time in the resuscitation room particularly in high-level, level one trauma centers. They do better, it's very clear. It, there's no question. So, does it make sense to have an express lane? Probably not. And the reason why is because people tend to not know what to do with the express lane. I think that we should have an express aisle. Because with an express aisle, you have a very, very finite number of problems that you're addressing. Like I said, isolated head injuries, stab wounds with the gut sticking out, cath lab stuff that requires primary, primary PCI. Those things would benefit. Now, how would I extend that further? Good question. Very hard to tell, very hard to know, but I would say critical lower limb ischemias. Critical lower limb ischemias, where it's clearly white and it's clearly pulseless, should have an abbreviated protocol that lands them straight for endovascular therapy, unless there are exceptions to the anatomy. Those patients most definitely benefit from that. But again, I will make this very clear. This is not something that I think is ready for prime time. It's just a food for thought discussion. Nothing more, nothing less. Um, just a quick shout out to a bunch of my friends. They are not my sponsors. I don't get anything from them, but I'm living in Kuwait and it's very hard to get scrubs. So DAR scrubs are great for that. You can either go to their website and they'll deliver the same day, or you can go ahead and pick it up from over there. They even do embroidery and stuff like that. And they have everything that you need uh, in terms of scrubs and uh, lab coats and clogs and everything else. The one thing that I will say is, the best part about these guys is when you, you buy something and it's not your size, you can always return it. It's always harder to return stuff that you buy online, especially over here in Kuwait. And I'd like to thank Vinyl Destination for the music in the intro and the outro. Also, if you're not bored yet, you can subscribe on YouTube, now Spotify actually, Google Podcasts, Amazon, and Audible, as well as iTunes and um, I'm not really using Instagram that much anymore, but every now and then I'll post something on there. Thank you all for listening, and please like, comment, and subscribe.